collaborative law is one of the tools of alternative dispute resolution. It's not mediation, it's not arbitration. I'm going to distinguish those. Mm -hmm. So uh, mediation is facilitated negotiation. That's the shortest definition I can come up with. Arbitration is private adjudication. Sometimes people confuse arbitration and mediation, but arbitration is decision-making, right? Collaborative law is representation without litigation. Mm -hmm. Essentially, in the collaborative law process, the lawyers are in the case only for negotiation. They're like solicitors instead of barristers. Mm -hmm. If the case has to go to trial, the parties can go to court, but they have to hire new counsel. Mm -hmm. So that creates a financial incentive for them to reach a resolution. Mm -hmm. And it creates a financial incentive for the lawyers who, who want to continue working with the clients uh, to negotiate in a problem-solving, solution-focused way. Mediation and collaborative law are not mutually exclusive. In fact, sometimes we can use them together. Mm -hmm. So the parties might be in a collaborative law process. They've hired lawyers, uh, and they're kind of stuck, so they hire a mediator to help them resolve the impasse. Uh, but when people come to me at the very beginning of a case and say, we're trying to decide between mediation on the one hand, collaborative law on the other, how do we make that decision? Here are some of the things that I say to them. Uh, number one, uh, do you feel that you need legal advice while you're in the negotiation? If you do, collaborative law makes sense because you'll have your lawyer right there in the room. Right? Now, in mediation, you can have lawyers right, uh, along with the mediator. Uh, often in that setting, the lawyers will take a more adversarial role because they feel like the mediator is going to be the peacekeeper and so forth. So there's a lot of advantage to the collaborative law process because you have two lawyers giving real-time legal advice to the parties. Often there's a coach, sometimes a mental health professional to help with communications. Um, and the lawyers are there as both advocates and problem solvers, and they have training uh, in doing that. Uh, another thing that's different about the uh, collaborative law process as compared with uh, certain kinds of mediations is that the collaborative law participation agreement says the parties will share information voluntarily. Right? Um, collaborative law has been used up to this point primarily in the area of family law. Mm -hmm. It's starting to be used uh, a, a bit more in the business area, commercial cases, non-family cases. Um, and in that arena, it's not customary for the parties to share uh, all information. So for them to choose a collaborative process, it means they have to be willing to put their cards on the table face up. And, and collaborative law tends to be a good process for uh, not only where you need legal advice, but where you're trying to foster an ongoing relationship. For example, in divorce, if the parties are going to have kids in common that they're going to be raising together, uh, uh, collaborative law is a good solution. For businesses, they're, e they're either trying to uh, continue a, a venture or have an amicable, you know, parting. They're going to bump into each other in the marketplace, so they need to have a good relationship. So, very good question. A lot of lawyers. Uh, bill themselves as, oh, I'm a collaborative lawyer. I settle most of my cases. Well, the vast majority of cases in our legal system uh, uh, settle. So that's a true statement for most uh, lawyers. The defining characteristic of a, uh, a lawyer who's committed to the collaborative law process uh, is one who's taken training uh, in uh, collaborative law uh, who's part of an organization where they get uh, ongoing uh, and updated uh, education and training and peer mentoring and so forth. Uh, and someone who's 
had some experience. Now, I know there's sort of a chicken and egg problem. How do you get experience? Well, um, by participating in these organizations, that's how you get your initial cases, as, as you get known. Um, but there is a curriculum of training for collaborative uh, uh, lawyers, and it involves some of the basics of interest-based negotiation, communication skills, and so forth, uh, and how to do problem solving uh, in a setting where parties come to the table feeling that they have interests that are in conflict. Well, how do we, how do we manage that? The, the definition of collaboration that I like the best comes from uh, a psychological instrument called the Thomas Kilman instrument. And in that instrument, you take 30, uh, you answer 30 questions, and it maps you on a matrix um, where the vertical uh, axis, the vertical coordinate, is all about results, and the horizontal axis is about relationship. And so people who care a lot about results don't care that much about relationship. That style, conflict style, is called competing. And uh, people who care a lot about relationship, not about results, they're out here. It's called accommodating. Mm -hmm. Then there are people who don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. and they're conflict avoiders, so they're down in this corner. Mm -hmm. And in the middle is compromise. Mm -hmm. But out here, in the area of the graph, where you care a lot about results and you care a lot about relationship, that's, that style of conflict management is called collaboration. And that's what the collaborative process is about. It's not that we don't care about the results. We do. We also care about the relationship. Mm -hmm. National Academy of Collaborative Professionals is a good meeting place for people from any part of the world who want to grow collaborative practice in their jurisdiction. There's an annual forum that takes place in the fall each year. The way to get collaborative law started in jurisdictions where it's not currently used a lot is to bring in someone for training and to bring together as many uh, lawyers, mental health professionals, financial uh, professionals who might be interested in this form of practice and bring them together for training. Mm -hmm. And once they get the skills training, then continue to have meetings periodically so that they are comparing notes on their efforts to, to bring in cases. Um, in Minnesota, where collaborative law got started, mm -hmm. began with one lawyer, Stuart Webb. Uh, back in 1989, he got this idea, he rolled it out, and in 1990, he invited some other Minnesota lawyers. It started with just a handful, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't take long to get to a group of 40 lawyers in the Minneapolis uh, uh, area who were interested in practicing in this way. And so when each one would get a case, they uh, would be asked, well, who, who can the other party hire? And so now you have a referral network, and people started getting more cases. So it requires a small handful of people to get it started. It requires training. And then it has kind of a life of its own. This is a little bit like asking which is your favorite child. Right. <laughs> so, um, with uh, with my children, for example, you know they have different uh, uh, lovely uh, qualities. Um, my son uh, likes doing things outdoors, so he and I uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail together, which was one of the most wonderful things uh, that I've uh, done. Uh, and I was so glad to be able to share it with him. My uh, daughter, she's interested in science. Uh, she's not as interested in hiking. Mm -hmm. um, and so she and I are going to visit the Galapagos Islands. My third child, we have to figure out what our adventure is going to be. Mm -hmm. But um, 
in the dispute resolution uh, world, uh, when it comes to teaching, writing, and doing the work, I see these three areas of my mm -hmm. life as entirely synergistic. Mm -hmm. If I could only teach, or if I could only write, or if I could only engage in dispute resolution practice, I would not be as happy yeah. as I am doing all three. The things that I learn from practice, I teach about. And when I feel like I really sort of understand, then I try writing mm -hmm. about them as well. And the writings are useful for the students, they're useful for the people I work with. Mm -hmm. But the core of all of this is practice. And I'll tell you one quick story. Mm -hmm. So some years ago, I had a collaborative case involving a couple who uh, just could not be together anymore. Mm -hmm. And they met with the two lawyers, my collaborative counterpart, and, and, and me, uh, one week, and then they met with their couple's therapist the next week. Mm -hmm. Then they met with us. And they met with the couple. They talked about the parenting issues with the therapist. They talked about the financial issues with us. And they were, it was such a, uh, uh, an amicable resolution that they decided they were going to continue working together. They had a, a non-profit that they ran. And so they were able to continue working together even though they were getting a divorce. And at the very end of the case, the uh, wife, who was my client, uh, said to me, we were in a conference room down the hall, and she said, uh, uh, do you have a camera? And I said, um, I don't think I do, but um, uh, maybe someone here in the office has one. I said, why, why do you want the camera? And she said, well, this process was so successful that I would like to take a picture of the four of us. And I thought, that is truly remarkable. Yeah. And the fact that in, we in the dispute resolution world can come up with techniques that allow people to resolve conflict and still feel good about each other yeah. um, is, uh, is, is really wonderful and inspires me to want to teach to, and, to, and to write to share mm -hmm. these kinds of experiences with people.